In this tutorial, we'll look at distortion and how you can use Wave Shaper to make sounds like this. Yeah, maybe you watched my last videos about like how to implement a real-time reverb on the STM32 or maybe also how to make like pitch shifting that you can pitch uh, shift up or down like uh, the uh, height of your voice. Um, basically, uh, I wanted now to make a video also about like distortion for guitar effects. And I really was uh, wondering if I should now prepare my own documentation on how the stuff with wave shaping and so on is working. But then suddenly I found a very, very nice video on the internet. And I think this guy has explained everything such in a nice way that I could not make it any better than this. So I would say we are just watching this video now together and looking how it's working. Then we're implementing it on the SCM32 and then let's hear how it sounds like. I would say let's start. In this tutorial, we'll look at distortion and how you can use Wave Shaper to make sounds like this. Distortion is one of those effects that's widely used but often misunderstood. Let's explore the Wave Shaper display. I'll be using a saw wave. The graph shows input on the horizontal axis and output on the vertical axis. By changing this graph, you can distort the input waveform. In bipolar mode, you can shape the waveform above and below the zero crossing independently. In unipolar mode, the graph affects both the upper and lower half of the waveform. When the waveform lies along the middle of the display like this, input equals output, so there's no distortion. Along the bottom, use pre to set the input level to the correct part of the distortion envelope. To help, this vertical line is a peak meter. It shows you where the input signal reaches. Mix is useful for comparing the pre and post distorted sound, or to blend in just the right amount. Post is an output level. Snap is useful for snapping the envelope to the grid. And we have an envelope menu here. So what's distortion? It's any change to a waveform shape compared to the original. Historically, musically useful distortion came from malfunctioning or abused analog hardware. Valves in amplifiers, then later transistors and tape were all sources of this distortion. Let's create some of these analog distortions with Wave Shaper. I'll swap to a sine wave as it's easier to hear the effects on a clean tone. Valve distortion is highly prized by some. Here's a valve from FL Studio's audio engine. One purpose of valves in amplifiers is to turn a small amount of current, the signal, into a large current, the output to the speaker. One characteristic of valves is the way they distort input signals when it approaches and exceeds the maximum output limit. This distortion is known as soft clipping. Soft clipping rolls off the top of the waveform. As we approach the maximum input, the output can no longer keep up and starts to sag, producing the characteristic soft clipping shape. Soft clipping is often the basis of warming plugins. The next step is transistor clipping distortion. Transistors are the modern equivalent of valves. This is a much harder rounding off. So uh, just pausing here at this point. I mean, the first thing what we can see already in here, like to get uh, the first distortion is uh, that we are manipulating like on variable input levels, the gain of the signal. So this means in comparison with some FIR filters or IRS signals, we don't need any delay or something like this. So it seems like that like most of the processing is only done with comparing the input level and depending if it is over a specific threshold or under a specific threshold, we are just applying basically different gains. So should be uh, implementable quite easy. Let's continue but it's still softer than digital clipping, which we can do like this. 
Notice how the clipping is inaudible until I drive the input into the clipped range of the envelope. You can also use this to your advantage, for example, by using velocity to change the input level and exercising different parts of the curve. So just for your information, if this is like an X, uh, Y uh, diagram, then this is basically your input level and this is like the gain, you're applying the curve and this should be then more or less the uh, output level. All good stuff. Another type of distortion highly prized by music producers is crossover distortion. This relates to the way the waveform transitions from positive to negative and back at the zero crossing point. It turns out that bad or malfunctioning valve amplifiers typically result in crossover distortion errors. Tape recorders can also do this when the bias is either not working or set incorrectly. In any case, it sounds like this. High crossover distortion is a key component of the distorted guitar sound. For example, let's play this guitar recording. First try. Now with some soft saturation. Next, let's add some typical crossover distortion. And finally, heavy crossover distortion. So I think this guy has basically reached the goal. So this is now the guitar sound we want to have in the end. And you clearly see that we are basically having uh, two main threshold points. So this means we have somewhere a threshold point on very low input levels and we have a somewhere a threshold here on very high levels. So the threshold on very high levels will us give more or less the saturation, which is modeling the saturation of a tube or like on a transistor amplifier. And then this is like really applying the crossover distortion and there we need like very high gains. So I think just for implementing it, it would be like quite easy to set like if the incoming sample is basically below threshold A, so this point, then like multiply, multiply it with maybe five or six to have then a very, very high gain at very low input sample values. And then having like a range where it is just a linear transfer function. And if you are having like a threshold over, yeah, or if your sample is basically over this higher threshold, then just multiply it with a gain which is basically lower than one, uh, making some kind of saturation effect in here. I hope this tutorial has demystified Wave Shaper and some common distortion types. Next time you hear producers talking about analog war. Okay, I think uh, this was it. Um, I will also put you the link of this video here below in the video description so you can watch it once again by yourself. And now let's come to the implementation on the STM32. Okay, now let's have a look into the STM32 project where I did the implementation now. Uh, just for your background information, if you had already a look in my previous videos about IRR filters or FIR filters, where I did like the sample uh, based um, processing approach, um, this is now based on like a plot based processing approach, uh, which I have introduced uh, during my video with the CMC's uh, DSP library. And yeah, the only thing you should know basically is that. Actually, I'm not like processing the samples anymore in the um, callback functions. Uh, instead of it, I'm like doing the processing here in the main while loop any time like a callback state here was triggered. And then here I'm doing like the restoring of the incoming samples from the Rx buffer into like the L buff in, for example. Then I can hear um, the main processing basically because it is looping over the main uh, mid buffers in here. 
and then I'm doing like the uh, restoring to the output buffers. And basically while I'm looping here all over the input samples, I'm applying the do distortion function to every sample from the left sample buffer and from the right sample buffer. So, and now we can have a look to the do distortion function. In that video, we clearly saw that we had like basically two main thresholds. So one time a higher threshold, which is modeled here with a gain, which was below one, actually to model the saturation of the tube amplifier. And on the other one hand side, we had like a lower threshold with a gain, which was higher than one to model actually the crossover distortion. And yeah, basically I'm also applying once again an output gain in here because that uh, higher threshold basically reduce the overall amount of energy of your signal uh, because it's more or less like compressing or limiting if you want it like this and therefore we have to apply an output gain that you get more or less maybe the same amount of energy in average let's say and also i have like here a threshold for the uh, noise floor because you know even if there's no signal present uh, the adc is also having like a small amount of noise which is sampled and yeah if i'm not doing like a threshold of the noise then you would hear really a lot of loud noise in the output signal which we also don't want to have basically and the only thing what i'm doing here basically is that i have like the absolute uh, function of the incoming sample in here and i'm checking if it is like uh, below the uh, lower threshold and on the same time like higher than the um, noise threshold and in case this is true, then I'm applying just the lower gain to the ensemble and also applying the output gain in here. And in case like uh, the absolute value of the incoming sample is like higher than the higher threshold, then I'm just applying the higher gain uh, to the input sample and also the out gain. And in case the signal is somewhere in between the two thresholds, then I'm just applying the output gain just to have the linear transfer function. And that's basically all. And now let's have a look into the audio samples, how it sounds. Mm -hmm. 